Hi, everyone. My name is Einat Orr, and I will be talking about reproducibility in machine learning pipelines. I would focus mostly on data reproducibility, but I would touch on all other things that are related to this painful problem. Uh, just a bit about myself. So for my very long career, I've started as an algorithms developer. I have a PhD in mathematics from Tel Aviv University. And uh, later on, I have moved to the dark side and led a few R&D organizations for Israeli startup companies, the last of which is SimilarWeb. I'm not sure if you're aware of it. It was IPO'd in 2021. It's now a very big and uh, public company. And it is a data company. And this is where we struggled with a lot of things related to data, which made me, after my six years at SimilarWeb, uh, open a company with my co-founder, Oz Katz. The company is called Treeverse. And what we do is we provide an open source project that is a scalable data version control system. So we will touch today on what data version control is and why it is needed specifically in data science. Uh, so from my experience as an algorithm developer, that is what the profession used to be called before all of you guys came in. Otherwise, I saw some software developments in the crowd when I looked at who decided to join the session. So as an algorithm developer, I remember very clearly that I spent a lot of my time searching for stuff that I did in the past, right? So I uh, created an algorithm, I trained it or tested it on the data set. All data sets were remote because they were pretty, pretty big. We were dealing with um, protein folding. So lots of very large uh, data items were there. And I was spending a lot of time trying to recover what was the data set that I had used in a certain situation that brought me to a certain conclusion. Sometimes I couldn't find it. And since I was collaborating on the data with other people, sometimes it just wasn't there anymore. Um, then uh, most of us adopted the uh, technique of copying the data that we wanted to mark as a milestone of our work, right? So we would put it in a, spe a specific folder and call it with a very specific name, a NAT final final version two, which four months later means very little. And we would go back exactly to the same problem because what we thought final final version two meant wasn't what it really meant. Um, and this problem actually persisted as data sets grew and the number of people in the profession grew with it. And amazing dramatic things has happened since. But the way that we work had changed in some aspects very much, but in others very little. And still today data scientists struggle with reproducibility in general and the reproducibility of data specifically. So what does a day in the life of a data scientist look like? And I will be guessing because I'm not hands-on anymore. But so we have the data. The data is usually a big data set and it is remote. Uh, if you want to train it, most of the work we do is local. So we would be taking a subset of it, not necessarily a statistical sample, but a sample of the set or a, a subset of the data that represents the space that we're interested in training our model on. And then we would be doing the training, creating a model. And we would want to mark that as a version that we would like to later compare to other trainings that we would do for the same problem, right? So we would do that process again, taking a different data a subset of the data, sorry, again, or or a sample, train it, get the right version of the model. Now, nowadays, sometimes we use a model that we take from Hugging Face, still the parameters that we would be using to run that model change, and we would like to mark them as a version together with the data that we have used to train to get those. And again and again, so it's iterative work that we do, and that part where we version our work uh, is the part that is still very much manually, not always organized, and make us find ourselves spending more time than needed on looking for where what we've done is, and um, 
compare maybe aspects of our work to what we do now. Okay, so what we want is to be able to track the, the work that we do very well. It means that we need to track all aspects of what we do. And I've kind of uh, split it to three main things. So one would be the code itself. The other would be all the uh, parameters that go with the code in order to create a model. And the last one would be the data itself. Those are the three things. If we can track all of those together, we would be very organized in our work and it would become easy for us to create those versions that we discussed, compare them and move from one to the other. So some problems are solved, yay. They were also solved 20 years ago. When it comes to code, we know exactly what we need to do. By the way, data scientists and analysts don't always do it, but it should be done. We can simply manage our code in a version control system. The most common and also best one out there is Git, and hopefully you are all Git users. And what we get by versioning our code with Git is full reproducibility of the code, together with an ability to tag it and so on, uh, collaboration with others, um, using the merges, for example. Of course, any form of auditing and compliance can be done when everything is version controlled. We have the documentation. If we, of course, bother to put it into the version control system, and we can do experimentation very easily, relying on the different versions of the code. Right, so we are all aligned on that, and we're all doing this. Another aspect, aspect is actually the parameters or configurations, uh, whatever we choose to call it. And that would be not the code of the model or um, what trains the model, but rather the values that we choose to put inside for all, all kinds of variables that we use. I'm trying to be as general as possible, so excuse me if my language is a bit general. Uh, and here we have newer tools that really help us. Those are logging systems. Again, the most common one is MLflow, but there are others. Of course, everything is open source, as promised. And ML, MLflow is a logger within our notebook that allows us to very easily version control any aspect that is not code. Right, so if we put certain values into variables, we can make sure that MLflow would audit those into the database that it manages, and we can then connect that to the version of the code. We can also use Git with MLflow. And then we have the picture of what our code was and what were the parameters we have played with within our notebook. And then we come to the data. So you can version the data with MLflow, right? If you have put in 10 files, you can just ask MLflow to remember the paths and you'll have them. Two problem, problems with that. When it's 10 files, it's nice. When it's a million, it's a different question. And the second is the fact we know the path to the file doesn't mean the file is still there. It also doesn't mean the file hasn't changed. And those two protections don't exist if we only log the file name. So in order to really work safely, we need something more robust that can help us manage the versions of the data. I'm sure you're all aware of what is called uh, uh, data-centric machine learning, uh, which really revolves around not what happens to the model in the life cycle, but rather what happens to the data, making sure that the data that we use to train is the best data possible, managing the versions of the training data, to ensure that we really converge to the best result we can. So with that, the idea of having a data version control system starts to make a lot of sense. So we want Git, but for the data. And here we present LakeFS. It is not the only data version control system, but it is uh, the, um, first of all, it's mine, I admit, I am not objective. So this is something that we have created, again, open source, so for you to use. Uh, but it is the most general, so it handles all data types in all places you need it to, and it is not really limited in scale. 
Uh, but what is data version control? So the data version control idea is to manage data the way you would manage code. So you hold your data in an object storage or other form of storage, and your data stays in place. You don't have to move it anywhere. And LakeFS or a version control system for data would come on top of the data and create an abstraction that allows you to manage the data like code, which means provide you with capabilities such as merge, branch, commit, rebase, and so on. And uh, also provide you uh, the API for the storage itself. So the version control system becomes your way of accessing the data, while you can access not just the data, but a certain version of the data. So you still use all the tools that you're used to using, and this is just an example. Anything you can think of is supported out of the box. And you simply need to specify not the location of the data, but rather the version of the data that you intend to use, right? So you see over there, the main, which is the main branch, it could also be experiment 715 that we are currently accessing, but everything related to that experiment would be within that branch. We are talking about the data, right? So this is a branch of your data. Okay, and um, you can work with the UI, with the CLI, whatever you need. Um, and this magic happens only through metadata operations. Again, this is also common to all uh, data version control systems, not just LakeFS. Data is not copied it is managed using pointers. So basically, when you want to start with a data version control system, you would be importing the data. That doesn't mean moving it or copying it. It simply means creating those pointers to the data that you actually have right now. Okay, so this is the first phase. We now have pointers to all our files or all the files we decided to manage within a repository. We will then run an ETL, try and uh, create a training, a model, make some sort of change to the data. In this example, we have deleted one file, so you can see it grayed out, and we added one file, so you can see it green and new, but it is not pointed to from the initial commit because it wasn't there. Now when we will commit our changes, we would get a new set of pointers. Any data that hasn't changed would simply be pointed to again, which means we are completely deduplicating our storage. On the other hand, we will be pointing to new files that exist that might be new versions of old files. Okay, now if we want to create a branch, that is a very, very simple operation because it only means pointing to a commit ID. Once I point to a commit ID, I point to a set of pointers and I get a branch of the data that I can work in alone in isolation. So I'm not bothering anyone and then no one bothers me and I can run an experiment on my branch. When I complete the experiment, I can either merge my results or I can just discard the branch, create a new one and continue to work. Of course, if I want to go back to a version of the data in the history, I simply turn to a commit ID. So if, we, uh, if you remember the changes in the path, instead of mentioning the branch itself, you would mention the commit ID. You want to go back to it can also be tagged just in Git. So you can have your a not final final version too for the data. Uh, and you can go back to that tag and get exactly what was there at the time of that experiment. So that is, in general, in high-level data version control. Another aspect that is important is that uh, most of us spend uh, some of our work, or most of our work, uh, done locally on our machines, right? Uh, so this is part of the research work. So we want to be able to use data version control also when we work locally. And here we have Lake City, a local that simply allows us to create a local clone that would download their repository or the branch of the repository that you want to download locally. 
it would still have that representation as if it is on the storage. And you can then make whatever changes you want and later on commit them, but also make sure that they influence the remote storage where the data is or not influence it as you see fit. So it can combine between local work and remote work very easily. And as of last week, it also has mount capabilities. So you can actually represent the uh, versions of the um, data that you hold remotely as a folder within your local workstation. So this is data version control. OK, um, I'll pause here for questions. Yes, please. So we only tell you that there is a conflict um, because when it comes to large amounts of data, representing it as a difference between two files is very difficult, right? So we would point to where in which files the conflict exists, but you would have to sort it out manually yourself. As you do in Git, just Git gives you more information about exactly where that conflict is. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, how does it work with Tableau data? Does it work with data? So it works with any uh, data type simply because the versioning is done on the, on the um, file level, right? And so if you're asking about open table formats, just as Iceberg, Delta Lake, and Hoodie, which are a table representation over the storage, then yes, it is supported and it does provide some additional work to what we have just seen to manage the log files or the uh, manifest files in Iceberg. I was also asking about things like iTables, which are stored like... Yeah. You can have millions of rows in one file. No, no worries. The, the scale of the file is not a problem for LakeFS. Because storage is immutable, then there would be a change in the file, right? This doesn't work on a row level. It works on a file level. So you would see that there was a change within that file. Right? There's, there would be no information. OK, I understand what you were looking for. So no, there is no row level uh, management here. It's a file level management. Again, if you use open table formats, uh, then you would get a bit more because there is access to more information about what the file holds. Yes, please. Sorry? So that depends on the storage that you are working with. Basically, LakeFS allows in open source um, a repository, uh, general access control uh, capabilities that it's if you're an admin or not an admin. And for more than that, you would have to turn for full RBAC that actually allows you to access only certain branches or only certain repositories and so on. You would have to turn to the uh, paid version, as usually done in open source. <laughs> Uh, but we see a lot of uh, organizations that don't really need RBAC, at least at the beginning, because there's one team or different teams using LakeFS, each one with their own installation, because it's very easy to install. And then the access control is less critical. Yes. So again, since the object storage is immutable, a file doesn't change, it is being replaced, right? So you had the file, if you changed one row in it, you actually rewrite the whole file. And then LakeFS will have two versions of that same file. One would be pointed to from one commit ID and the other from the other commit ID. Right, so let's assume the two last ones are actually the same file but with a change, or the one that was deleted is the same file as the one that was added. So the old version would be pointed to from one commit, and the newer version would be pointed to from another commit. Both would exist. 
if you delete those commits, you can also delete the data that was pointed to them. It's called garbage collection, and that makes sure that your storage doesn't just inflate, right? Because you can just delete the versions you don't need. Actually, when using data version control, usually the storage shrinks because people no longer copy data. If you by accident commit a file within the storage itself, not through LakeFS. Uh, yeah, that. If you delete it through LakeFS, nothing happened because it's still there. It is pointing to by other commits, and you can revert and get it back. If you are trying to work outside of LakeFS, uh, you can cause damage, and that is actually solved by the cloud provider or your local storage permissions, making sure that you can't access those files not through LakeFS, right? If you put in uh, a safety layer, you don't want anyone to go around it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Please go ahead. <laughs> That's, that's a great question. It, also, it is also very relevant to reproducibility, right? We work with P PII to train our models, and then a request to be forgotten comes in, and we need to delete that specific person throughout the history of everything we did. There goes reproducibility, right? So we can have reproducibility to the point allowed by GDPR, which means LakeFS would help you, and that is a feature in progress, to delete from all versions that specific person or those specific per people who were requesting that delete. And then it is not full reproducibility, but it is at least the best you can get under GDPR, assuming you are training with PII. Yeah, what LakeFS helps with is at least give you all the copies of the data where that PII exists. Because if you work without a data version control system and people are copying data around, you don't know which, which is where, you can never be sure you actually deleted that people, the people who ask to be deleted from everywhere because you don't have control of what everywhere is. When you use a data version control system, you know exactly where those copies are, right? Yes, there was a question there, and then we will continue. Please. No, unstructured is a very, very strong use case. Unstructured, semi-structured. As I said, since this works on a file level, the logic of the versioning works on a file level. It, all data formats are, are actually uh, supported. And there are a lot of LAKFS users that use uh, version control over unstructured data, together with its metadata that is some, sometimes structured. OK, let's move a bit forward. So we were all convinced we can work locally. Uh, so what are the benefits that we get here? And this is maybe the main thing. Talked a little about how it works. What does it do for us? Let's recap. So during development, we can open a branch and then we can work in isolation. That means that if I have now several experiments that I would like to do around the same model, I can open several branches and run several experiments in parallel, right? With different versions of my notebook, do it very quickly in parallel and compare one to the other. Also, uh, I can uh, debug any problem that I have, because I can, for example, if I have a problem in an ETL in production or a pipeline in production, I can open a branch of the data at that point and debug it on the side in isolation while production keeps on moving and the data might be still changing, but I have the snapshot of the data at the time of the failure to debug. And of course, I can collaborate very easily. We know that from uh, code version control systems. Uh, during deployment of data, and deployment would mean first ingesting new data into your systems, and then when we're running in production and we are creating new data, um, then uh, we would like the safety of uh, kind of uh, write audit publish for our data, right? So we would like to write the new data, whether ingested or created by us, 
test it or validate it in certain ways, like the, its schema, for example, if it is structured data, and other qualities that we might want the data to have from a statistical perspective. Again, if the test passed, we can then merge the data to the main branch and have consumers use it. If the test fail, we have the data at the time of the failure to debug, going back to development. So this sort of CI, CD, but not for the code, but for the data, or again, write, audit, publish, is extremely useful in all data pipelines that you manage, not only in the specific work of a data scientist. I see the question, I'll get back to it in a sec. I'll just finish the slide. Um, and in production, of course, we have the power of rolling back. So bad data arrived in production, and trust me, as I said, six years providing production data to customers, customers find the quality issues, right? So you have a few customers telling you something seems odd in the data, you realize something went wrong with the algorithm or with the input data or God knows what. What you want right now is to go back to the last version of the data that was consistent and, and stable. It might be old, but at least it's correct, right? And we want to be able to do that in one atomic action. Usually when we present data to our consumers or a model to our uh, users, uh, we have very many data sets that are influencing that process and reverting all of them manually is both error prone and takes time. Well, if you use a data version control system, it's 10 milliseconds, one atomic action, and you are back to the latest commit, stable and consistent commit. I think I'm back to questions. I can skip that. That tells you, yay, life would be great if we version control everything. Are you convinced? Okay, so we can go to questions. Um, I'll start there, please. <laughs> Hi. So files are saved to the storage according to their content, not to their name, right? So it's a hash of their content. So if a picture with the same name had changed, it is a different file from a data version control system point of view, right? So it would consider an addition. And yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, it's being appended. You're, yeah, are you using Azure Gen 2? What do you mean by being appended? So it's either micro files that are being added to the uh, storage, and those are different files, just in the same collection. Or if a, a file is actually, actually has append capabilities, it's a different thing. So it's a data set, but it would be different files, right? No, for example, for one hour, for a certain patient, we are adding data to a file. But for example, if I have to collect some data that the patient generated within the same file, yeah. uh, that would be a new version of the file. So you would have the old version of the file already existing and a new version. And yes, you can definitely merge. And when you merge, you can say you want uh, the source of the merge to be the one that dominates the situation, and then it would delete the old file and put the new file instead of it. Okay. Right? Okay. okay. Like a source wins situation. Uh, so like exactly. Any other questions? Oh, yes, please. Over there. I'm sorry, I can't really see you. Can we turn on the lights a little so I can? Thank you.
Yeah, so, so, so LakeFS manages metadata for each file, and that could be very big. So you can actually put all that metadata into LakeFS, and then uh, it, it, you can search according to that metadata. So you have that within LakeFS to allow you to manage all the metadata that exists. Some of that metadata could be a path to a file, assuming your annotation is a huge file if that happens and not something small you can put in. But then all your metadata is there, including uh, results of it. So I found a cat here or a dog there if that is useful for you. And then you have search capabilities over that to create the a uh, subset of, uh, I'm assuming, images that you would like to, to pull out in order to train. Do you have any control Yes, of course. Of course. If you, you, yeah, in, in some organizations, the metadata is another file, right, together, and then, of course, it is version controlled because it is just a file. If you choose to use uh, LakeFS metadata, it is also version controlled, of course. It goes with the commit of the file, so every time it changes, it is committed. Yes, please. So it, that wouldn't be me, it would be you putting in a test, right? So you would ingest the data to a, an ingest branch, so it's not yet used in production. You would run a test using your testing system or using one of the testing tools that is out there. And LakeFS would wait before merging. It is called a pre-merge hook. So it would wait before merging to the result of your test. If the test passes, the data is merged. If the test fails, the data is not merged and then it exists for you to debug. And this pattern you can build for ingesting data, but also for intermediate results or the full results of any data pipeline that you run. And by that, you ensure that only high quality data gets to production. I think I'm out of time, um, and I want to be respectful of the next person that has to speak, but I am here and I'll be happy to answer any other questions that you have in the hallway. Thank you.